As a format, stop-motion animation has both severe limitations, but also many unique freedoms. Since director Wes Anderson has started working in the medium, there has been a marked evolution of his style, one that I argue has been carried over to his live-action work. There are obvious examples of this, the use of miniatures, forced perspective, or matte paintings. With this, there's an increased sense of mixing the artificial and the real. Must love. Anderson's camera generally seems to be at a further remove, often capturing his characters from a greater distance, as though they are merely models in his cinematic Wendy house. In this video, we'll look at how both the limitations and possibilities of animation changed the way Wes Anderson approached live action filmmaking, with a particular emphasis on action sequences. Let's start with what animation doesn't let you do. Many camera moves the director deployed in the past, like handheld and steadicam, rely on operators holding the camera. In stop motion animation, you shoot models one frame at a time. There's no way for anyone to physically hold a camera. Therefore, the shots are primarily static or the camera moves on an axis. In his earlier films, Anderson would use a handheld camera to emphasize emotion. Steve Zissou truly connects with Ned for the first time when he's in danger and the camera shakes to show his turmoil. Handheld is a go-to when characters are in a heightened emotional state, such as... It's a staple for visceral action, like in war and action films, and Anderson followed this convention early in his career. We had the robberies in Bottle Rocket, the fights in Rushmore, Eli's car crash in Tenenbaums, Where's my shoe? or the shootouts in Zissou. Whole sequences are primarily shot with either handheld or steadicam. The techniques create a visceral thrill, but the sequences lack the formal order that Anderson is renowned for. Post-animation, Anderson minimized these techniques, evidenced by the climactic set piece in Moonrise Kingdom. The sequence includes some handheld camera, but it's the exception, not the rule. And it becomes all the more impactful because it's contrasted with more precise, orderly camera moves. This leap is even steeper in the Grand Budapest Hotel, arguably Anderson's most action-packed film, with a ski chase sequence, a museum chase, several fights and a shootout. Yet the number of shots where the camera is handheld is around... Zero. Basically, in-camera editing means that you have two or more differently composed shots in one, without an edit. It can be achieved by the characters moving around in the frame to create a completely new setup. Yet more frequently, it is achieved with the camera. For example, you start with a medium and the camera moves in for a close-up. Or the camera pans right to reveal another frame altogether. Anderson uses these techniques all the time, which you can see here from his first film, Bottle Rocket. But since he started working in animation, there have been two key evolutions. The first is precision. His style has naturally gotten more precise as he's evolved as a filmmaker, but animation sped things up. This shot from Budapest is very similar on paper, yet the camera moves more mechanically on an axis. And when the movement stops, the second shot is a perfectly symmetrical composition that matches the initial setup. While in Bottle Rocket, not so much. The second evolution has to do with characters and camera movement. In his earlier films, the camera often moves with the characters, and the camera operator follows the actors as they say their lines. Like here, where Mrs. Cross talks and the camera follows. Well, he's dead now, so I'm not actually. In his post-animation period, he's more inclined to have characters play catch-up with the camera. They'll even wait for the camera to stop moving to say their lines. <coughs> How should you keep your fur so clean? There's no shampoo on Trash Island. You heard the rumor, right, about her and Felix? Holy fuck! What's the meaning of this shit? Boy with apple, I thought you did. Why are you noticing now? Are you fucking kidding me? This, of course, feels quite unnatural. Many directors prefer to work around actors, adapting their pre-planned shot choices once they see how performers instinctively feel like moving in a scene. Yet after working in animation, Anderson seems more confident manipulating the movement of his characters 
in tandem with the camera. True, I guess. Correct. Which added a few layers to the way he does blocking now. Take this shot from the fantastic Mr. Fox. The camera move is straightforward, but what is happening within the frame is quite complex. Animation's painstaking process affords you the time to map out these type of shots, so you can plan where the characters will go to a T. Plus, models are easier to control than living, breathing actors. However, the precision in blocking is at least easier to achieve if you plan live action like you would animation. Which brings us to animatics, a technique frequently used in animation. Basically, it's the blueprint, the first rough cut of the film put together with moving drawings before a single scene is shot. It's a cheap way to test out ideas and map things out. One that Anderson adopted for the fantastic Mr. Fox, but surprisingly kept using in his live action follow-ups. And even in ads he directed. You can see how similar this one minute long take in the meadow is to the animated scene we saw before. It's apparent the biggest concern was the movement of the characters, because the setup is so complicated. Instead of edits, the camera moves right and stops three times. Every time it moves, the quote unquote cut is preceded by a cue. First, a conversation from the right. Wes, what do you suppose happened to him? I'm not sure. Second, the movement of Bill Murray's character. She stole the batteries out of my And third, the call out of one of the scouts. Hey! There are similar shots in his films before the fantastic Mr. Fox, but they tended to be simpler. Here, the camera also moves left to right but it slows down for each conversation instead of stopping, which is easy at a time. Instead of moving around, the characters remain mostly static, which is easier to capture. Yet the biggest difference is that in Moonrise, you have actors carrying out identifiable actions in the background, whilst in Rushmore, you just have a bunch of extras generally moving around, which is easier to orchestrate. Anderson's manipulation of foreground and background elements has become more sophisticated post-animation. Here in Moonrise, he has characters operating on three different levels, with our main scouts in the middle, their accomplices in the foreground, and a suspicious scout patrolling in the background. Or here, where he uses the background for visual gags of the scout's activity, from a rocket landing within the frame to a scout swinging across a zip line. This technique is by far in its most complex form in his most recent film, Isle of Dogs. The camera moves themselves here are fairly basic, yet the movement throughout is dense. And it's a great way to feature all the major characters in a scene at the same time, one of Anderson's trademarks. Trying to achieve this with uncontrollable elements and real actors is trickier. In the Grand Budapest Hotel shootout, he employs his characteristic whip pans to achieve a similar effect. The lack of cutting makes the action feel more tangible as it's not being constructed in the edit room. Nobody move, everybody's under arrest. It's common for action sequences to be confusing, not only with camera shakes, but with rapid editing as well. And often a scene's geography is poorly established. In this scene, we have a hard time knowing where the characters are in relation to one another. And the logic of the action goes out the window when this fella throws a grenade to the other end of the ship. All the lessons the director learned from the fantastic Mr. Fox help bring order to chaos. On paper, this scuffle was orders of magnitude more anarchic than the Belafonte shootout, yet everything is clearer. This is due to his evolution in delineating foreground background action in a much clearer way. The precise blocking of characters that lets you see the player's defined movement and the precise camera work, with longer, sustained moments of in-camera editing. It all adds up to not only the geography of the scenes being more apparent, but the sequences as a whole are more clearly mapped out as well. Thanks to animation, Wes Anderson has managed to reinvent his own style to do away with conventional techniques that weren't exactly idiosyncratic. He now designs action sequences in a way that's all his own. We just have to wait and see how the experience making his second animation film will change his style once more in his next film. I heard he was making something about France. No. Of course. Oh, that makes Whoa. sense. Where do you get all these rumors? I mean, who tells them to you? I don't know. Anybody dogs talk and I listen. Always have. I uh, love gossip. Perhaps after watching that, you're now inspired to learn how to animate. If so, 
that I'd like to recommend the video's sponsor, Skillshare. They're an online community with thousands of classes in design, business, technology, and lots more. You'll find many in-depth courses by teachers like Jake Bartlett and Fraser Davidson that teach you the fundamentals of animation. And many of the classes are designed for people who may have never even used programs like After Effects before. It doesn't matter. You'll be taught step by step from scratch. And Skillshare isn't just for learning new crafts. I find it great for evolving ones I'm already experienced with. As a filmmaker, I find their tutorials on cinematography and the many other crafts of movie making invaluable. As I said in the Wes Anderson video, these skills are a lifelong evolution. There's always more to learn. You can get an annual subscription for less than $10 a month, and I have a link in the description, which will get you the first two months free. That's for the 500 people that sign up first. And if you're looking for yet another video on Wes, then check out my editor and co-creator's one, which looks at his unique use of the God's Eye perspective. It was recently released on Lewis's own channel, Beyond the Frame, and it's just a really great video. As always, turn on notifications if you want to get new content the second it's launched. And thank you to my new patrons. I really appreciate the support.